there isn't just one path and there are so many different creative ways to be successful. I definitely downplayed it to my parents, like not even going to lie. I was like, oh, it's just like bikini photos. There's nothing wrong with the female body. I went from earning a couple hundred dollars extra to like 20, 30,000 a month. Hi, welcome to Thrivecast, where we talk about success and what it means to different people. I'm your host, Alana, and today our guest is Michaela Samantri, also known as McKK17 on Instagram. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. Um, thanks for coming on the podcast. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to have you on. This season is all about OnlyFans. And I do want to talk about like your YouTube stuff. And I know you've transitioned into more of like a YouTuber. Um, so we'll talk about all that today. Sound good? Can't wait. That sounds perfect. What I like to normally talk about first is kind of like your upbringing and um, what your family taught you about success and kind of how that shaped your idea of it um, into your career and who you are today. That's a really good place to start and perspective. I never even thought about that, but I kind of uh, have a bit of different views of success, I guess, from my background because my parents, um, they put me into like a private college preparatory school. So through my academic years, success was very much like go to college, have more nine to five um, job and climb that success ladder corporately. But then my mom was always a stay at home mom. And she, she went to college after I was born. So it was a very more non-traditional route. And my dad was in the Navy for a little bit. And then he worked for the city that I lived in, but my parents personally never really pushed college onto me. Um, I did end up going and it, it happened, but, um, I feel like I never felt like that was the only path to success. And it was actually kind of hard in college because I knew that my parents were successful outside of college and that there were so many other ways to, um, grow a career. And my mom, she, I'm one of five kids, so she was home with us a lot, but she also was a real estate agent and had a few other, um, career dabbles here and there, but, Uh, yeah, I guess my perspective on success was kind of understanding that there isn't just one path and there are so many different creative ways to be successful, which was nice because a lot of my, um, peers growing up in school did have more of that rigid. I have to go to college. I have to get my master's. I have to do like a PhD program and follow that, which is great. But, uh, yeah, I feel like I had more, um, like openness about what I could end up doing. Why did, why did you end up going to college? If you kind of had that idea already young that you didn't have to, why did you choose to? Um, originally I wanted to be, I guess I still am a writer, but I wanted to pursue writing and, um, I wanted to get my master's in English and creative writing. So I was kind of following that path, knowing that I could also teach English. I, was getting a few publications in school already. And whenever your writing is published, they ask you to send over a little bio about yourself. And I was reading through other writers' bios and they always mentioned, you know, their degrees or their master's programs or what they taught. And I felt almost like, oh, I should um, pursue that and see where that takes me as well. But, you know, when I was in college, I started YouTube and social media and that's like a whole other um, part of this, so... So you were doing it during call, you were doing like YouTube and all of that during college. And then is that when you kind of realized, oh, this is kind of the direction I want to go in? Or was it to it like, was it after? I don't know if you can hear my cats, but oh, God, I can't. <laughs> the, they are going at it right in front of me and they just like yelped. So <laughs> it's like having toddlers, but, um, uh, sorry. <laughs> what was your question? <laughs> um, I was wondering if you knew, um, in college that you wanted to pursue social media full-time or if you ha- like, didn't realize that until afterwards. Kind of throughout my years in college, it started to, uh, social media started to, um, become more of a, 
a hobby with a paycheck, like a job, but I also loved it so much mm -hmm. um, because I started making YouTube videos my freshman year in college to keep me busy. I had a really hard time uh, just adjusting to college. So YouTube helped a lot. And then by the time I was done with my bachelor's program, I was earning enough on YouTube to consider pursuing that. Mm -hmm. um, so I made the decision instead of going to get my master's right away, going more into debt, kind of seeing like where social media would take me. And I'm really glad I chose that path. And I always knew that I could and still can get my master's, but um, yeah, that's kind of why. Yeah. It's still an option that leads really good into how did you discover OnlyFans? And it seems like YouTube was the first thing. And then obviously like, that's how it was for me too. I, I had been doing YouTube for a while. And then once the hype kind of started happening with OnlyFans, I jumped on that and that's when it took off. But how did you find it and what like interest did you have in it? How did it all begin? Oh my gosh. I really stumbled into OnlyFans. Like I had no idea when I started that it would become such a big part of my life or it would lead to everything that it's kind of led to today. Mm -hmm. Um, beginning of 2020, I started to hear a little bit about OnlyFans from a few different YouTubers that I watched. And I originally was just going to do like one YouTube video on OnlyFans. I was going to test it for a week, see if it's worth it. I had very, I didn't know much about it. Like at the time I knew people were making money, but I didn't really, it didn't click. I was, I didn't understand the platform to its full extent. Like um, I kind of saw it as Patreon. I knew it was a subscription based platform, but I didn't really know that it was more of like an adult, um, platform in the beginning. And so I just was going to make this YouTube video. I tried it for a week. Here's how much money I made. Um, and the first week I made, oh gosh, I can't remember exactly now because it's been over two years, but I think like a couple hundred, like 400 or 600 or something like that in one week. Um, and that's kind of when I realized that there was something there. And then the YouTube video itself, surprisingly to me, like surprisingly, cause my channel was so small at the time and I got a couple hundred views, but that video about OnlyFans did so well. Um, and I knew as a creator that like when something is doing well, ride the wave, ride the wave. like, make, yeah, definitely. <laughs> So I started kind of simultaneously making more videos about OnlyFans as well as continuing OnlyFans and both YouTube and OnlyFans just started to um, do well together. Were you already making adult content? Like once you got on there and realized that that's kind of like the vibe of it or did you ease into it? Like, or what was that journey like? Because obviously making YouTube videos is a lot different than <laughs> making content on OnlyFans. How long did it take for you to get comfortable and all that? I definitely eased into it. Like you said, um, in the beginning, I mean, everyone has their own boundaries and I always mention in my YouTube videos about it, how like it's important to feel comfortable and don't feel like you have to push yourself to do anything that is outside of your comfort zone or boundaries necessarily on OnlyFans. Mm -hmm. Um, but in the beginning they were definitely more like saucy pictures, <laughs> some that like maybe I'd post on a Snapchat story or close friends. Um, story on Instagram, but, uh, within the next two years of doing OnlyFans, that comfort zone definitely expanded. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think just the, oh gosh, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of like the tab, not taboo, but like, there's nothing wrong with yeah. the female body, you know, like, yeah they're just boobs like I get it's over not that. it's normal it's yeah natural. yeah yep, exactly and you get more <laughs> comfortable like seeing it and then you're like oh this is really not that big of a deal at least to me that's how mm -hmm. I, it was for me like in the beginning I was definitely hesitant and I was also worried about what other people thought of me and then as time went on I was like I honestly don't really care what anyone thinks because I'm not like if I feel comfortable yeah. what does it matter to anybody else what was that journey like for you as far as like your family finding out the things that you do or friends or people, you know, acquaintances, uh, did you feel any hesitation there and any pushback from people around you? Not directly to my face. I'm sure people had things to say, but ignorance is bliss. As long as I'm not hearing it, it's fine. And like you said, I really don't 
care necessarily. Um, with my family, uh, a cousin actually told them like I, someone around my age found, it's not like I was hiding it either. Like I was making YouTube videos about it. So she texted, my cousin texted my sibling, my younger brother and was like, oh my God, your sister's doing porn, which at the time I was like, no, I'm not. Like I didn't understand really, (laughs) um, (laughs) that like what it, yeah. And so then he told, my brother told my parents and they were like, what are you doing online? But I definitely downplayed it to my parents, like not even going to lie. I was like, oh, it's just like bikini photos. Like it's nothing bad. Like I posted on Instagram. Um, And I also think they just choose not to even like think about it or yeah, like I'm not, yeah. They're just going to believe what I'm telling them. Not like I'm lying to them. Like a lot of those photos are like that, but they're my parents. So I think, bit. yep, definitely. Um, I, but I, think I feel like parents, they don't need to know it all. Like they don't, yeah. know, you know, <laughs> they just need to know enough and that's fine. Exactly. And they were definitely more proud of the money and like kind of what that was leading to in my life than the content itself. Like I was able to get myself out of student debt. Mm-hmm. I was able to purchase a home. And so yeah. they focus more on that than the photos themselves. I was going to bring that up. It, it led to a lot of um, really awesome accomplishments in your life. What do you, because th- I know you kind of are transitioning, right? Like you don't do as much OnlyFans content anymore, or I don't know all about it. I just know from what you told me, um, uh, why is that? And how is that journey going? So uh, I actually think I want to have a comeback on OnlyFans. Oh. Like these last few months, <laughs> I've kind of been missing it and yeah. I'm still on the platform, but I'm not as active as I used to be. Okay. And I think I'm getting nostalgic for like summer 2020 and 2021. Like it was a good time. Yeah. So I might be coming back, but um, <laughs> oh, that's yeah, good I kind for of, all the viewers. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I started to focus more on my YouTube and Um, with all of my OnlyFans videos on my YouTube channel, um, it's just, you always get a little bit of hate, you know, and it doesn't usually bother me, but the OnlyFans platform itself, I itself just seemed a lot more of like a negative space towards the end for me. And I wasn't as happy doing it or it wasn't as fulfilling. So I did take like a little bit of a break and I stopped making videos about it. But now it's been almost a year since my last OnlyFans video on YouTube. And I want to start making more, I think. I want to start talking about OnlyFans again because it's always been a source of income. I just stopped kind of talking about it as much. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, so we'll see what ends up happening. You mentioned that it was kind of a negative space for you for a bit. And I recently just talked with um, Bentley. She's I am Bentley on Instagram. And um, she, after actually the podcast, we didn't get into it on the podcast, but um, she mentioned that one thing about OnlyFans is that she's very hard on her body and like, and how she looks. It was it a negative space for you in that way or more of like comments or both? And, and what's your feelings on like your body itself I think it was a negative space in so many ways like definitely a little bit with my own perception of my body and like my content and then also the fans themselves um people that have subscribed to my plot or my OnlyFans page but because I was also posting videos about how to be successful on OnlyFans um I got a lot of m- it just kind of opens more doors, I think, of different types of feedback. Yeah. And um, I I don't know. I think someone mentioned that you also offered like OnlyFans shout outs or promos to other girls when they inquired to me about some sometime one time. But um, I like would offer promotions to other creators to help get their pages out. And I think that if someone like doesn't really understand that a promo is not like guaranteed fans then it's just like I had to deal with people upset at me with that and that was really frustrating so that's kind of why I stopped yeah I I actually talk about that on some of my YouTube videos about it um that you need to find somebody if you are going to buy promo you need to find somebody that looks like you make similar content to you like literally 
log onto their OnlyFans and see what kind of content they make. You yes, need to exactly. and someone that like I don't know some so that you know their followers are even going to be interested in you because like if somebody like if I buy promo for from someone who's blonde like fake boobs and like a fake butt they're probably not going to want a tattooed brunette curly haired girl <laughs> you know what I mean like there's just oh, yeah people want different things so you have to be smart about where you're buying promo from and it has nothing to do with like anything that's wrong with you or me if someone's buying promo from us you just never know what your audience wants so I totally get that and yeah. I've had some people <laughs> have a hard time too when they don't get any followers um exactly or it's frustrating too if they see um somebody else purchase a promo that might have like a free page or a three dollar subscription tons of content similar audience like getting new fans from it mm -hmm. and then someone else has like a thirty dollar subscription not as many posts different like audience that obviously won't get as many fans but it's hard to say that almost um but yeah you also mentioned um a little bit with your body image and how you view yourself um do you want to dive into that you obviously don't have to but uh I think it's it's helpful especially to people who want to start OnlyFans because one thing for me is when I first started I was actually I'm really really tiny already but I was a lot smaller at the time so now seeing my body grow has been really hard for me um so if you want to talk about that yeah. Um, I, okay. First, a question. Do you yeah. ever edit or like touch up or facetune pictures that you post to OnlyFans? Yes. And I, and I find that it's hard because sometimes I'll look back at pictures and I'll be like, Oh, I looked so good then. And then I forget that was an edited picture. Um, so, but I do, I still do it actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not every picture, yeah, but I, I smooth out my skin and, yep. you know, do all that. I don't uh, normally like adjust any of the body, but I always smooth out the skin. Okay. I'm about the same way. Like I'll smooth the skin if need be, but I never um, face tune or make any part of me really smaller or curvier. Mm -hmm. um, but I do know that a lot of people do that on OnlyFans and it's hard because my mind will know like, yeah. oh, that's Photoshop. That's Facetune. They like brought that in a little bit, but I'll still see it and be like, I don't look like that on OnlyFans. Yeah. And when I first started, I didn't edit the photos at all. They were very like, I wanted it to feel like I was just sending it as a text to like yeah. my partner or someone, you know, like just yeah. shooting it on my iPhone real quick, like a naughty little mirror pic and then posting it. Um, and I still love that type of content for OnlyFans. I think it's easy to make. I think it's real, authentic, like fun. Um, but I know other people will do like professional photo shoots or they'll rent a hotel room or there'll be props. And um, you do kind of get into your head, you know, a little bit like, is this good enough or should I be doing that mm -hmm. and comparing um, cause that's inevitable. Like every single yeah. social media platform, if you're looking at someone else's content, you're going to compare a little bit mm -hmm. I I do that a lot as well and recently I just had a photo shoot like a professional photo shoot um and it was because I felt like I needed to you know make better content but I another thing that I talked about with Bentley in the last episode was that she, she said she's done both and her raw content always does so much better because that's what people want but I think it is hard because you like are comparing yourself to other people that do edit their pictures and you don't know what you know their audience might be different than yours so I get that for your comeback do you know what you want to like is that something that you have in mind like how you want to approach your body image going into it again I think because in the beginning I was just doing really simple and edited like photos of myself in either like the bathroom mirror or just in like the selfie style of your phone. Um, I want to start back simple like that again, because that's where the fun was. Um, mm -hmm. And we'll kind of see. I always just want to follow what I enjoy doing because again, towards the end of when I was very active on OnlyFans, it started to feel like a chore. It started to feel like, oh, it's been three or four days since I've sent out new photos. Like I got to take something. And it started to feel more like work and not as as fun and I want it to always be fun I want it to be something I enjoy as well as earning money from mm -hmm. um so 
everything's kind of open, I guess, at this point, we'll see what ends up happening. Yeah, I think in any career, there's like that burnout where it doesn't feel fun anymore. And you just have to reimagine what like the fun could be. Um, I've gone through so many waves of that. And I feel like I finally have like caught the fun wave again with OnlyFans, but I definitely go through like ups and downs with it. I think I've been doing OnlyFans for three years. Um, and I've had so many downs with it where I will take a break from it, um, where I don't like it as much, where it doesn't, it like makes me uncomfortable, but then I have so many ups and highs with it because it is like, it's a great job to have. You get to post pictures on the internet. Like yeah. what better, like, can you, like, <laughs> nothing's better than that. Um, so let's talk more about your YouTube channel because that is where you began. That's what you've been doing right now. Um, how has that been? And, and what do you see for the future for your OnlyFans, but also for your YouTube channel? It's always kind of like, oh, whatever ends up happening, like, I'm just going to chase this, ride this wave and see what opportunities come from it. Mm -hmm. But of course, I also want that stable income, that success. And I, I feel like I've gotten to the point where I can say that, um, cause YouTube has been like one of my main sources of revenue for a couple of years now. Um, but I, I love YouTube. Um, it's so fun. <laughs> I've been doing it since like what, 2015, I think consistently. Mm -hmm. Um, and YouTube definitely like ebbs and flows a lot mm -hmm. with, uh, how much you're making with the algorithm with views. So it is kind of challenging at times to figure out like how to keep that, uh, consistent and stable as well. But I just want to grow like a very solid foundation. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm getting there. I'm at like a hundred and two K like over a hundred thousand subscribers at this point. So awesome. I'm pretty proud of that. <laughs> yeah, you should be. What do you, how do you measure your success when it does? Is it by the numbers? Is it by the income or is it something else? Probably a mix of all of that. Um, yeah, I think just when I'm able to live that comfortable life that I think a lot of people want as like their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And I do feel like I have like achieved that in a lot of ways. So I'm very happy about that. But you know, you always want to like do better and grow and learn more. So there's always like a new goal. Like as soon as I hit like 20 K I'm like, okay, 50 K or a hundred K. And right now I, I can't wait to hit 200,000 um, and see where that goes. But, um, and another thing about success, do you feel like you need to have like a team around you, like a people that support you and help you, or are you like one man standing? Like you've got this on your own. Like, how do you, um, cause I know for a lot of people that work for themselves, it can be kind of lonely. Um, do you have people that you work with or is it just kind of just you? I think it's just me at this point. I've gone through um, a few stages where I've considered an assistant or a manager help like that. Like when OnlyFans videos were kind of at their prime and peak of my YouTube channel, I was very overwhelmed and stressed with work. Um, and I did interview a few girls and had some help um, for a few months. But at this point, I'm just so like, this is my baby. Like I need to make sure that I love every single like detail second of a video editing. Like I have a hard time letting somebody else do that for me. Mm -hmm. Um, and I enjoy doing it so much. Like it would take all the fun out of it for me if I just gave that part to somebody else. Yeah. Um, so it is a very lonely, like being any type of content creator, if you are self-employed or um, working for yourself, like being your own boss and all of that, <laughs> like it can be very isolating and, um, lonely at times, but I'm also an introvert. So I enjoy it most of the time. <laughs> yeah. How do you manage your schedule? Cause that is a lot, you know, there's editing, filming, like the marketing side of things. How do you manage your schedule? It is so different. Like as soon as I feel like I have a good routine that works for me, something will like flip upside down and it will no longer 
be my preferred schedule and I'll change it completely. But I'm also a Gemini and we're very adaptable and we don't stick to routines. So um, I think that might just be a, a me problem as well. But I, I like getting up early, like 8, 9 a.m., and having those few hours just to get to like emails and do more quiet sit down work. Mm -hmm. Um, If I'm filming content, that is like a full day thing. Like I'm only going to get ready and look presentable like one day. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And I'm going to get as much content out of that as possible. Yeah. Uh, So it does vary. I, um, I noticed that because even from the last season of this podcast, talking to people, a lot of people are like, I like to do everything myself. I like to take full control. And then the same with, um, with you, like their schedule, they're like, there's not an exact like consistent schedule at all of us are kind of like, oh, well, we like to do it like some days like this or something like that. I'm like you, where I like to get all my content done at once so I can like, <laughs> do the rest of the stuff the rest of the week. Um, and like, just get ready once. Um, but I noticed that all of us are kind of similar in that way where we want full control and we want a kind of lenient schedule with things. Did you ever have a job where you did have to go in every single day and, um, kind of stick to those type of schedules? Yeah. And I hated it. (laughs) Like I couldn't do it. I kind of had a few jobs Um, where I'd only be there for like, I think the longest was like six months to a year before Mm -hmm. I finally quit. And I worked in daycares. I was a nanny, babysitter, tutor. Um, I used to waitress and I did love that job because of the people. It didn't really feel like work when I was with all my like best friends at the time. Um, but any type of job and even with serving too, like the hours shift so much. Um, So it it wasn't like a nine to five every single day. Mm -hmm. Um, But the ones that did feel like that, I was never upbeat and happy and enjoying my time there. It was always like, oh, five more hours until I can go home. Like such a drag. (laughs) And you're like counting down the minutes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think there is a reason why like so many people that do social media um, are that like controlling and want to do everything themselves and like to switch up their schedules like you said and there's a reason why like we're we're good at what we do because we we thrive off of making our own schedules than following somebody else's yeah I mean it's still hard don't get me wrong sometimes I'm like I really got to motivate motivate myself to do something today (laughs) but I do work better when I can choose when that is because also I used to work corporate and I would have to get up at like 5 30 6 a.m to get there by 7 and I don't work well in the morning <laughs> like I work the worst in the morning <laughs> like I need like you said I need to wake up around 8 9 and then have an hour to adjust that I'm awake um yeah. <laughs> so like for the first like few hours I remember at my corporate job I would just be like doing the bare minimum and it, I wasn't mm-hmm. very productive that way you said that you're kind of motivated on your own in that way. What do you think has helped your success? And like, what what motivates you and what keeps you to wake up in the morning and do the things that you need to do? Kind of like the sky's, like this is so freaking corny. The sky is the limit though. Like with doing your own thing on social media, like there is no cap on how much, um, like how much money you could earn off of something or potentially, you know, like yeah. um, there is no minimum or maximum amount of work like if you want to shoot and post like 12 videos go for it if you want to like start a podcast or like create like a work trip for yourself so that you can shoot content or make something somewhere else like you can do anything you want I think that gives me so much creative freedom Mm -hmm. to really think outside of the box and be like this is going to be so fun to create and that's like what I'm always looking for is creativity with my work Mm -hmm. um and just trying to think of new ideas and constantly being able to just push myself creatively is like the best part. How do you stay creative? Like what inspires you? Do you watch other people's videos? Do you um, subscribe to other people's OnlyFans? Like what um, inspires you in in those creative spaces? Definitely. Yeah. Other people's um, content. I, I think I watch a lot of similar YouTubers or mm-hmm. I end up watching a lot of like 
lifestyle home vlog mm -hmm. um, channels as well as finance channels. I guess a little bit of everything with like renovation content too. But um, I see how other people are creating or um, doing like different things. And I'm like, that's really awesome. Like I want to try that or I want to try to do something kind of off of that in my own way. Um, and then I, I like to read and journal and I feel like a lot of ideas come to me when I am journaling, oh, um, that's cool. and working out like yoga. Okay. Like I have a lot of ideas on my yoga mat. <laughs> it's like when people are like, oh, in the shower, I get the best ideas. It's like yeah. yoga you're <laughs> like in your, like in your space. Mm -hmm. Um, Bentley said she was really motivated by money and you just mentioned finance. You watch finance videos. Um, mm -hmm. did you like when you started doing OnlyFans, obviously it brings in good money. Did you know how to manage that when you started getting that? And and what does that look like for you? Because you do watch finance videos. So tell me a little bit about that. It was all like learning as I went through mm -hmm. it, I think. Um, because in the beginning I was just making enough. Well, even before I started OnlyFans, I was kind of just getting by with rent bills and um, like loans, mm -hmm. but I knew I had to kind of make more money, which is why I was trying um, all these different ways to earn income on my own. Like OnlyFans was one of them, but before I made that video trying OnlyFans, I was trying door dashing. I was trying like other websites that claim you can earn money from it. So um, when I started to get more um, income off of OnlyFans. At first it was to pay off medical debt, car loans, student loans, just putting it wherever I could to pay my bills. Mm -hmm. And at the time, like I was just renting a small apartment. Rent was like dirt cheap mm -hmm. and it was really, it allowed me to kind of use what I was earning and put it towards getting myself out of like student debt. I was like 23. So kind of just starting that financial journey, but, um, it definitely like the the earnings grew so quick on OnlyFans. Like I went from earning a couple hundred dollars extra to like twenty, thirty thousand a month. And when you're like 23, 24 years old, I'm yeah. like, how do I keep this going? How do I keep it safe? Like what do I do? So I learned about investing and I started a brokerage account as well as my Roth IRA. Mm -hmm. And then I opened a high interest savings account. And after all my debt was paid, that's when I started to really save for a house. And that got me to where I am today. But honestly, like YouTubers and TikTokers taught me everything really? back then. Like, I was okay. just on YouTube being like, how to start investing <laughs> and like writing down all these definitions for words that I had never heard about before and really kind of learning from like, Andre Jick's channel, he does a lot of like stock market videos on YouTube. Mm -hmm. He taught me so much about saving and interest and money itself. So, so you were just like, I need to figure this out. All this is coming in. I'm, and you did all the research on your own. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, that just sparks another question that I had about, uh, and I lost it at the same time. It's on the tip of my tongue. Oh, okay. Yes. So you're making a ton of money on OnlyFans. What do you think you're like, six like how were you so successful was it just that video on youtube or how do you how did you promote i think it was mostly youtube like i got very lucky with that because i know that the majority of people don't have that platform to go off of or people that want to keep their identity separate mm -hmm. have a harder time promoting like their stage name or their other account um but with YouTube, I was riding that wave. I knew OnlyFans videos were doing well. So I was trying to push out as many as I could about how to um, earn more money, like biggest mistakes I've made when starting my account, tips and tricks or whatever I could think of, like red flags. And um, I was also updating like how much money I made off of OnlyFans in a month, in a year, like um, showing that side of it as well. So I think YouTube gave me that push. Mm -hmm. um, but then as like a tactic on OnlyFans, the way that I was earning the most money was through DMs, like sending out those private pay-per-view yeah. photos, videos, and then honestly, like pricing them higher than I 
probably needed to because I knew that people would buy it. I didn't realize actually that DMs made the most money until like a few months in to doing OnlyFans. Like it took me like three or four months. And then I was like, oh my God. And it like doubled my income after that. I was like, oh shoot. Actually more than double, I think. I feel like the most money comes in from there. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And then being able to like post teases of it on your page for free or like on the wall and saying like, you know, check your DMs for like the full uncensored pics. And like, that's where all the money is. Yeah. When the whole, um, like when OnlyFans changed their policy or like supposedly was about to change their policy, what was your mindset? Like, do you think that OnlyFans has a, a longer life than it, it like, almost proved to be because it was going to cut off I think last October um, and then they changed their mind do you think that they would do that again how long do you think OnlyFans life will last and and what does that look like for you going back onto the platform yeah I never expect OnlyFans to stick around forever like ever mm-hmm. since Vine died like RIP but ever no, since Vine, Vine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm it just I've same um even with YouTube I'm always like it could happen like keep that in mind diversify your like streams of income or like your platforms but when it's working like I'm going to try to make as much money as I can in that moment and I knew with COVID too that OnlyFans was probably doing better because we were all home Mm -hmm. quarantined and people were trying to earn more money um but as a company's like for from a company's perspective for OnlyFans, like if they're making money, why would they like shut down their site? Yeah. If we're still earning money off of it and they're earning money off of us, then I think it'll be around for a hot minute or two. Yeah. And you just mentioned that you you had always been thinking about diversifying your portfolio. What a, what does your portfolio look like right now? What are your like different sources of income? Obviously, YouTube, OnlyFans. Um, what does that look like? I also kind of off of those have affiliate links, um, and then merchandise off of like my YouTube, um, investing. I make some passive income off of that. And right now it's kind of small for what I prefer. I know I, we, we just listed like five, four or five, but, uh, there was a time like in 20, 20 where I got up to 14 streams of income and I was like hell yeah and that was when I was doing like my podcast and I well I guess I have sponsorships here and there too so that would be another one I should think about it and write it out soon because I'm not sure how many (laughs) streams of income I have right now but the goal is always to have as many as possible yeah I feel like I can be more organized with mine as well I'm like I know they're there but I don't have yeah (laughs) I'm like I need a budget that's what I need to do so like have like know where all of it's coming from. Yes. Um, okay. So the last thing I always ask all my guests is what key piece of advice would you give someone striving for, you know, success in their life? Oh gosh. I feel like I get so many people that ask like, oh, I want to start YouTube or start OnlyFans, but I don't know, like, is it worth it? Or I wish I started sooner. Now I, I think it's too late the best time to start is always going to be yesterday. Mm -hmm. Like you just got to do it, like get it over with. Um, The genesis of anything is like the most important part. And I think it's also the most challenging, but if you can create that account, post that first video, just like get it started. It gets easier and easier. And you're always going to regret not starting sooner. So true. So just start. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) pretty much (laughs) yeah okay that's a good piece of advice and um if you want to shout out your stuff it'll all be linked down below if you guys want to find um Michaela so please shout yourself out (laughs) yeah you can find me on YouTube it's just my full name Michaela Samantri which I know is like super hard to spell but if you start like sounding it out as you spell (laughs) I'm pretty sure it just shows up um and then OnlyFans is just my full name as well. Instagram, McKayK17, but anywhere, pretty much, and everywhere. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for having me. This was really fun.